Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. Angeles and the Big Apple. I'm Dave, the caregiver's caregiver, <laughs> coming to you live globally on 25 audio and video platforms. And I have my lovely co host, Adrian Gruberg, here with me. And how are you, Adrian, today? I'm fine, thank you. And is you fine. All? <laughs> I'm fine too. What a coincidence. We're both fine. And as I said, and Ellen. <laughs> We'll get to we'll get to Ellen. We don't yes, want to. Yes, and I am really fine. Know how she is. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thanks and, for asking. Uh, we are on twenty five global audio and video platforms, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, Stitcher Radio, Blog Talk Radio, just a whole bunch more. I won't bore you. In fact, we're voted number one podcast on the top fifty on Player FM, uh, number two on Caring Village, and number three on Feed Spot out of thousands of caregiver podcasts. And we have especially have an exciting show planned for you today, don't we, Adrian? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Ellen Long Stillwell is a registered nurse, certified in hospice and palliative care while raising two boys. She volunteered as part of the hospice team with Metropolitan Jewish Health System. She worked for several years for the Visiting Nurse Service of New York, where she cared for hospice patients and families in their homes and nursing homes, NYU Hospital and Mount Sinai Hospital hospice patients. She's been all over the place, as well as working with Calvary and Liaison at Wield Cornell, I hope I said that right, transitioning Wild. patients. And <laughs> Wild. Wild. Yeah, I'm, apparently I don't know how to pronounce the uh, okay. names. Um, <laughs> from the acute care setting into hospice care, she's currently working with patients and families at home, the heart of hospice. Ellen is also trained as a death doula mm. by a Buddhist monk, of all people, and currently mm. lives in Manhattan. Ellen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hello. Yes, you know, um, just a reminder that this show is uh, being recorded and will broad be broadcast on all those networks and on Caregiver Dave as well as um, all the other places that I mentioned that I didn't mention. And uh, Ellen, we'd like to ask our guests, who is Ellen Stillwell and why was she placed on this earth? So why don't you take that oh. very big question before we ask you anything else? <laughs> Okay. Um, well, that is a very big question. Well, I am now 60 years old, so I have been on this earth uh, for this lifetime uh, to reach the ripe old age of 60. I'm the mother of two very uh, lovely young men. My oldest son is now married, and um, I'm working currently as a hospice nurse. Um, and really passionate about it. You know, over the weekend, we celebrated uh, Easter, and, um, you know, we had a small gathering of a very large family, you know, where we are all vaccinated, the portion of us that are vaccinated. And um, so I am, I am the sixth of seven children, and a small portion of us were able to get together, and I've missed everyone. So, so I have, um, so here on this earth, from a very large family, a very large, lovely family. So the unlucky ones didn't get to meet because they didn't get their vaccine yet. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Well, let's just start with um, why are you so passionate about being a hospice nurse? How did it all start? Well. Well, it started uh, actually ultimately with uh, the death of my husband. Um, oh. My husband died in uh, 2003. He was 48 Sorry. years old. And yeah. Mm. 48? You know, it's really quite 48. Yeah, he was 48 when he passed. And oh. um, I was 42 at the time. 
and oh. our children, our two boys, yeah, they were. Um, How when old he were was they? Well, when, they, when he was diagnosed, they were four and seven. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to say, ultimately, that's why, because after he passed, I said to myself, I'm going to be a hospice nurse. Mm -hmm. I had been a nurse for quite some so time up until that point, but you not had a hospice, hospice nurse. experience then with your husband, yes? Yeah, you saw how it yep. ran mm -hmm. or should have run or didn't run. <laughs> Were you well, happy we actually, with this hospice care? Actually, we didn't have hospice within our home until 24 ah. hours prior to his death. Yeah, yeah, so he and I did it together. And oh. when hospice arrived in our home, I was just exhausted. And I, I, I actually felt like the cavalry had arrived. <laughs> he, Were they he, impressed? He died. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they but he, oh, you know, it really was, I, I don't know, we didn't really get a chance really to elaborate, you know, they, they were going to come back the next day and, and he was gone by the next day, oh. but did they help you? Uh, but ultimately that's why, no, actually that day they helped him. They went directly to him and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think whatever that nurse discussed with him helped him to transition yeah oh mm -hmm. yeah but i had been a, a nurse already for so long and mm -hmm. um so i had a lot of experience in the hospital with with patients dying you know not being prepared for death as a right. young nurse so um it was ultimately really caring for my husband and his illness for two and a mm -hmm. half years i was just like i'm gonna be a hospice nurse <laughs> So what did he die from? Pancreatic cancer. Oh. Was it genetic? Was it in his family? I mean, how did it happen? No, none of that. No, he, he, we really don't even know about it. I remember him, him asking the oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, you know, how did this happen? And the answer, I, I can picture the, the oncologist. I hear the oncologist still. <laughs> he said, we get a new cancer every day walking through this door oh my god we, we don't have the answer as to why yeah mm -hmm. but he he combated it for two and a half years and so the very natural progression of uh the illness you know just took over mm -hmm. well there's so many new caregivers that come on board constantly <laughs> just like new cancers i guess um, right especially during the covid maybe some people out there don't even know what hospice is or palliative care so maybe you can explain mm -hmm. you know like this is a football <laughs> you know, yeah well, okay all right so hospice and palliative care is um end of life care hospice is specifically end of life care palliative care is is the treatment of pain without giving up treatment for the diagnosis. When, when hospice is decided, there is no further treatment, and the mm -hmm. goal of care is the same as palliative care, which is comfort, pain-free. So both are, are seeking the individual to be extremely comfortable. Palliative, palliative care, you continue treatment. Hospice care, you give up treatment. And hospice care is at end of life. But hospice care will take care of pain. Oh, a hundred percent. Yes, that's the goal. That's, I, yes, that's our if goal. There's medication. And that's the medication. Yeah. And what mm -hmm. determines that they're going from um, palliative to hospice? What are the standards? What are the the, the situations that have to happen in order yeah. for that to happen? You know, it's a really hard call, and mm. it's the oncologists who make that call. You know, sometimes it's the families too, or the patient themselves, they get so exhausted by the treatment. Mm -hmm. The chemotherapy is really so um, exhausting that if the oncologist doesn't recommend that the treatments aren't, um, you know, doing beneficial. what they should be doing, right, thank you, beneficial. Um, so the oncologist might suggest hospice. Um, 
maybe there's a new metastasis that they know that the treatments just aren't going to uh, be able to eradicate. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also to the patient, you know, it's either the oncologist or the, pa or the patient that comes to the realization that um, the cancer, uh, most often it's cancer, but we have other diagnoses as Parkinson's disease. Sure. We have patients with Parkinson's as well, dementia, Alzheimer's. Well, um, did that answer your question, Dave? Yes, it absolutely did. That was the easiest uh, way for anyone to put it: is that they're both mm -hmm. pain management, but one stops the uh, the care. Um, does is it typical that the family, uh, when they go against the oncologist, that they want their patient to? continue treatment or is it because or is it more common that they want them to stop treatment you know it's really according to the oncologist i've met a lot of oncologists and you know they get very attached to their patients so you know i've i've heard of oncologists really having a hard time letting go and they want to seek really? cure they have so much hope mm. really oh really the, these oncologists yeah, they get very attached to their patients. And then there's others that are, um, you know, more rational and and understand uh, it's time to move along. Allow uh, the natural progression. Yeah. So what does the, um, when the decision is made to go from palliative to hospice, does the family mm -hmm. usually get depressed? I mean, how do they handle it? It, it all depends. Uh, some are relieved. Well, it really, it really, really, right. It, um, yes, it, it all depends <laughs> on the family unit and the individual. I, you know, the reason why I paused was I wouldn't use the word depressed, but I, I was trying to quickly think of a, a different word. Um, it's like resignation. Resignation. Um, yeah. yeah, resignation, and um, and really, when a hospice comes on board, it's such a different atmosphere, and we're a team of passionate individuals who come into this family's life, and very often it's a breath of fresh air because we're not doom and gloom, yeah. and um, and they're meeting this team of people for the first time, and they are making this big change of uh, from treatment. To, to, you know, these chemo treatments are uh, very debilitating. So when someone is recovering from chemo treatments, they actually get better. But also psychologically they get better because they have this team of people helping them. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. So mm -hmm. are there I mean, common there myths? Be, Go ahead. There can be a great feeling of relief. Uh, in in a family and end of life care when a hospice shows up. Um, yes, it, that, I've, it's I've, often I've, true. Is that just placebo that effect, at, kind of? No, not so much. A, uh, there's relief for the patient, but there's also relief for the people who've been taking care of him, his family, his or her mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. And um, I know when my mother was in hospice care, uh, she was out of hospice, she didn't have it at home but they were as concerned about me as they were about her. And it was really refreshing to have that happen yeah. at that particular point in time. Yeah, and likewise, my mother who had Yes, dementia, and that's what I experienced. Um, uh, my mother who had dementia also went into hospice when, you know, she was just, uh, it started progressing and, and they could have done things. And I said, listen, she has an advanced directive doesn't want to sustain this life. She's put up with dementia for 10 years. She wants to go. So just do whatever you can to uh, hasten it. Make her comfortable. Yes. Mm -hmm. And stop treatment, mm -hmm. stop feeding, stop uh, drinking. And then she got a uh, an infection in her uh, bladder, as mm. you would imagine, because you're not getting liquids. So they treated that. They gave her antibiotic. And she went quickly, and that is good, good for her, good for us. And she said her goodbyes to everybody, and and it was it was a great thing to have. It is a comfort thing. Um, 
any um, myths or common beliefs about hospice that just is not true that you want to, you know, straighten people's minds out wherever they got these misconceptions from? Well, um, yes. A, a lot of folks won't even entertain the idea of hospice because they have misconceptions. So when hospice comes on board, we're not there to hasten death. The use of morphine is used in hospice care commonly. And even morphine doesn't hasten death. You know, used in the correct dosages, which are very small amounts given sublingually under the tongue, morphine makes our patients very, very comfortable. So that's the common myth that, and that's why a lot of people don't ask hospice, does, they don't invite hospice in because they feel that it's going to hasten death. Hmm. I don't know if that's a cat wailing or a siren in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I Hopefully have a it's question. not a dead cat, yes. Um, is hospice ever called in for a patient who's not end of life? Or is hospice well, always end some, Yes, well, actually, sometimes that is actually the case. So. Um, Two doctors have to agree on a prognosis of six months or le less. So okay. the, 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 either the oncologist or the primary care physician and our hospice medical director sign consent that they feel professionally that this individual has six months or less. So that, mm -hmm. that, that allows the Medicare hospice benefit to unfold. But at this six month mark, I, I, I go back to some people get better when hospice care comes on board. This mm -hmm. is a team of people coming in your home, a home health aide there helping. You know, yeah. it's really um, not unusual that a patient has to be uh, let go from hospice. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask you, what's the longest you are allowed to be in hospice before you're taken off? Well, I've actually had hospice was patients for years um, because yeah. at this recertification time you, you, we have to look at all this various criteria that Medicare gives us to look at and you know very often you know the patient might have a, uh, a bed sore so that meets criteria uh, uh, where we're treating a, a bed sore and very often these bed sores just don't want to heal so that's that's something that would keep someone on uh, the under hospice care or a recent infection, uh, as you mentioned, uh, that would keep someone on hospice care. So I've actually had hospice patients for years. Mm. Elizabeth, we're gonna take a short break, so we'll be right back, don't go away. We are a community of caregivers that understands and supports you wherever you are in your journey. We are a place to connect with other caregivers but more importantly, a place to get practical, actionable help. There are lots of ways for you to get support. First of all, you can download our welcome pack. This will get you started on your Thrive journey. Next, you can ask and get answers to your questions by posting them here in our private Facebook groups. You can also get live online support by attending one of our live Weekly Connect webinars. You can get practical, actionable advice by listening to our weekly podcast. You can hear and read other stories about other caregivers' experiences. Plus, add your own in our weekly Share Your Story forum, posted every Tuesday in the Facebook group. You can access essential resources and download practical Thrive Solutions Packs, all of which are geared to help you thrive as a caregiver. You get lifetime access to all of our resources. Again, we are here to support you and help you thrive and to enjoy your life as a caregiver. And remember, this is a place to get hope, not just cope. And we're back with Ellen Stillwell, our guest, and Adrian Gruberg, and I'm Dave Sandy on the Caregiver Dave Show. And we're talking about hospice. We're talking about palliative care. We're talking about end-of-life stuff. So 
if you have a loved one who's going through that, <laughs> you want to pay attention. So you wrote a book, right? What is the name of your book? I did. Uh, it's Love, Death, Love. And how did you come up with that title? Well, I came up with the title um, because the person that's transitioning to death, we love that person. Mm -hmm. Then they die, and we continue to love that person, and they continue to love us. So it's we love them, and then they die, and then we continue to have this energy of love. What inspired you to write it? Well, yeah, what inspired me to write the book? Um, I, I worked as a, a volunteer in the hospital within the, the team of the hospice team. So, so not only do you have a registered nurse, a social worker, a home health aide, a spiritual counselor, a, a physician, but there's a volunteer. So for five years, I volunteered uh, in this hospice that is actually uh, in the Bronx uh, when I worked for um, for Metropolitan Jewish uh, Health Services. And mm -hmm. I would go to this hospice once a week for an hour. And the nurses always liked to see me come because they knew just who they wanted to send Ellen to sit and talk with. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, these, these patients um, let the nurses know that I was helpful to them. And they, they would come up to me and say, what, what are you saying to the patients? They say how helpful you are. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm really repeating myself over and over again with uh, each of these patients. So I thought, let me write this down. So I, I, I the bulk of, of what I would sit and discuss with the patients, and then, then the years kept going and I was still writing, so I added more experiences. So um, that's why I wrote the book. It was really to, in hopes that my experience experiences would be helpful to others mm -hmm. so does it come out is it already out How oh yeah it sure out? it's it's um it was published uh march of last year so yes it's yeah mm -hmm. it's okay. it's available mm -hmm. and it's a it's, short book it's not it's it's a it's it's i've written it in order for, for it to be easily read did you self-publish it, or did you have a publisher? I did. I self-published it with Balboa Press. And you've been getting good uh, response about it. People are reading I it. I really have. I really have gotten a very good response. Of course, at first it was my brothers and sisters, uh, but then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it was friends, and then friends share it with their family members. I have a friend who um, is from Ireland. He just bought 15 books, wow. which he he's gonna he bought one for each of his siblings. Their their dad have has already passed away, and he felt it's helpful even after the person has passed away. And then he uh, is gonna gift uh, several to the hospice where his dad uh, passed away in Ireland. Mm. Yeah, he 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 got a lot of help from it, and he. He really thinks his siblings and the hospice would also. That's so is it, is it a help to the loved ones, to the, um, to the family, or to both? Uh, what, what's in the book? It's, what do you talk about? Right, okay. So it is helpful for the dying person, and it is also helpful for those caring <laughs> for the dying patient. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, I'm... I drew a lot of experience from my years as a nurse in the ICU. So I, I write about my my nursing years in the ICU, where I really was, I felt uh, overwhelmed by the amount of death in the ICU. So mm -hmm. there's a, a chapter about the ICU, and um, and then also about my sister's illness and her death. My sister was ill for several years. And I write about her illness, and um, and that really taught me a whole lot about what I know about death and that that personal experience too. And that's where I was becoming more comfortable with it. 
The amount mm-hmm. of death I saw in the hospital in my various positions in the hospital uh, was a bit, it was really not a bit, it was very overwhelming. You know, nursing school, they don't teach you about death. It's all about healing and, uh, and, and not, not death, which also occurs. Just naturally have, occurs. Have, have you approached any of the schools about teaching the nurses about? Yeah, as a matter of fact, <laughs> they've approached me. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes, yes. They should, because yes, yes. I found. I'm very excited about it. Ner- the, the nurses were not quite as uh, helpful as as hospice people in terms of making me more comfortable and because I lost my husband and uh, that was 10 years ago, but the people around me from, from palliative and from hospice were much, much more well informed. Uh, mm-hmm. They just had the right, right language. So a, a matter of language and caring. Yeah. What is your goal for the book? What What do you hope people will get out of it? I mean, is it is it basically just uh, like you sitting by their side, holding their hand and, and speaking? Is that kind oh, of what no. it's I, all I, about, comfort? <laughs> yeah. Well, the book is very, believe it or not, uplifting. You know, I'm talking about death from the first page to the last page. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's in an uplifting way. It's in a positive way. It's in a very loving way. So really the goal of the book, my goal in writing this book is really that others who read the book really are helped by me explaining my experiences and, and, and that you do come out the other side as a whole person. And and the dying individual, that there is there is a a um ah there's a there's a journey that they're on, and 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 you're on it together. So you can resist the journey to death, and a lot of people do do that. Oh, yeah. But if you don't resist and you're in it together and you're supporting each other, there's there's a time when you accept death. You accept that this is happening. And then then it's really this 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 is the beauty of it. Once ex- acceptance is achieved, then everything changes. I mean, the vibe, the energy, the experience mm-hmm. changes because a peace pervades and then this peace just allows this profound love to be emanating and death naturally occurs how does faith play a part in people's religious background you know i'm i'm reminded of that twilight zone uh series <laughs> uh mm-hmm. you remember the angel of death you know who is this good looking guy and and this old lady, she was. was her... It was it. It was Robert Redford. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? Yes, <laughs> it was. Robert Redford, <laughs> very <laughs> handsome Robert Redford. He was the angel of death, and she was observing him. and And every time she saw him, somebody died, and she knew he was the angel of death. And then he was knocking on her door, and she says, "No, I won't let you in." He says, "Please." He finally had to disguise himself as a police officer who was shot. <laughs> Who's begging for her to open the door, or so he doesn't die because he's, you know, his wounds, he's bleeding. So he tricked her, and she opened the door, and and then she wasn't afraid anymore. And, and, right. Uh, it, mm-hmm. it, it was an and that's the name song. of the bo- movie. I was yeah, in a Twilight, Twilight Zone episode. Original Ron Sterling oh, it's Twilight, a Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. Oh. I know you've seen it. Oh. Everybody's seen I, I, it. I'll, I'll have to hunt for it then. Unless Robert, you're not old enough. a young enough. Robert Redford then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think yeah. it's called The Angel of Death. But you know, yeah. But you know what but you, you are space really bring Right. So, so f- there's two things I really want to talk about in that presentation. And 
faith to, to, to directly talk about faith, it's really up to the individual. I mean, I, I have worked so much with atheists and um, uh, I, Catholics and Jewish people and Muslims and um, people of uh, deep faith, people with no faith and, um, and hospice care. Although we have uh, chaplains, even the chaplains are going to meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes faith is very helpful to people. And you know what? Sometimes a religious, uh, earlier religious teaching actually um, is, is not good for the individual. You know, those who were taught uh, in a very harsh way about a fire and brimstone hell, yep. you know, that, there's a lot of fear. There is a no, lot of fear. No so, forgiveness. Oh. My goodness. So I actually mentioned that in my book as well, um, in the chapter where I write about my godmother, who was really brought up um, Catholic and and how she got through um, her fears. It was it was really very interesting going through it with her. And I write a chapter about Catholicism in the book, too. And I, I had a Jewish patient who. Um, Again, you know, read the book because the chapter each cha I even have a chapter on a Muslim patient. So um, it's really it's really individual. With yeah. that's how I can answer about faith. But what but what is universal <laughs> in the process of dying is very often a family member would will say to me when I come in. Ellen, something funny really happened last night. And I said, oh, really? OK, well, tell me about it. And they tell me that the patient is talking to a deceased relative. Sure. They're talking to them. They are calling them by name. Yep. And you know, it's not like a conversation, but it's it's um, a, a communication of some type. And a lot of people want to just say it's an hallucination. It, the medication is causing this, but it happens very often. So often. and and. So often, yes, Adrian, very, very often. And I love when that happens because it's time. It's getting to be time to cross over. And, and their, their deceased loved one on the other side is saying, it's okay. I'm here. I'm going to greet you. And it's okay. And, and, and really, the individual, most individuals are very comforted by this, not frightened. I'm more frightened though. It happened to my husband. He was frightened. Yeah. <laughs> I know that my my mother would open up to a rabbi much more than she would open up to me. So the mm -hmm. the faith aspect of it was relief because she didn't have to keep it all mm -hmm. in and seem like she was brave and whatever. I mean, she was a mm -hmm. complainer, but she was able to talk to the the a clergyman in a totally different way than anyone in her family it, it mm -hmm. was very important and she was very comforted oh yes yeah mm -hmm. i can't help thinking that you've got two categories of patients one uh that believe in god or a higher power uh, mm -hmm. or a creator and and one who doesn't and I would think it would be very easy to convince someone that well, God is a very loving God, he's forgiving whatever you've done, you know, whatever. But how do you comfort the person who doesn't believe in a God, who just believes when you go, it's just black and it's the end of it. It's like before you were born. Is there comfort in that? Right. Well, the comfort is in their physical symptoms as they reach that end. Yeah, we, we, we stay present in the day, in the moment. Yeah, and I don't mean and, physical comfort. And physically. I mean emotionally. And well, some, some people don't have that emotional anguish. Yeah, some people don't have that emotion. But those who do, you know, talking about it is so very, very important. Yeah, mm -hmm. talking it out. And also the medication helps that psychic pain too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Actually, there's a comfort pack. There's a 
Yeah, there's a comfort pack. When someone comes on board with hospice, there's a comfort pack sent to their home. And within that comfort pack, it's a box. It's, it's a white box and it has a red seal on it, do not open. And, and we don't open it until I, the nurse, sees uh, physical symptoms occurring. Mm-hmm. Psychic pain, someone going through psychic pain yes. is, is a symptom. So there is a medication in the comfort pack, it's called lorazepam, and that really, really helps someone to, to talk things out and to get through that psychic pain. Let's talk about your husband's illness and how you handled his hospice time, uh, your mm-hmm. self-care, your self-help, and all of that stuff. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Well, self-care for the caregiver, I, I just can't say enough about it. I would, my, I have, I, I, you know, I mentioned earlier, I have a very large family. My husband, uh, the oldest of seven, so we would have uh, siblings stay with him. And I would go out bike riding and we lived in an area with hills and I would go up the hills, you know, just working off a lot of stress. And then I, you have mm-hmm. to come down a hill too. So flying Whee! down the hill was quite a bit of fun. <laughs> yeah, really quite a bit of fun. Um, so I also liked to hike and, um, you know, I'd like to say I ate well, uh, you know, very healthy, but that's not true. Um, <laughs> Taking take, taking care of myself was incredibly important to be able to um, stay present for him. Yeah, um, which I did regularly. That bicycle riding really saved saved me and, and gave me peace of mind to to get get back into the house and uh, get right beside him because mm-hmm. he really did depend on me. Although we had so many siblings, he really did depend on me. You were lucky that way. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This, yeah, lots this of siblings. We're going to take another break, so we'll be right back. Don't go away. Dave Nassani, the caregiver's caregiver, has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too, Thrive to Stay Alive as a Caregiver. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through because he is one. He now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his amazing caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child. And caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life too. Thrive and stay alive as a caregiver will help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life and learn to put their needs first. Pick up your copy today or buy one for your special caregiver on sale everywhere and at caregiverdave.com. And we're back (laughs) on the Caregiver Dave Show with Ellen Stilwell and my co-host Adrian Gruberg, and we're talking about hospice care and palliative care and her book, Death, Love, Death. And we were talking about self-care and how important it is for a caregiver to take care of themselves. Ellen was going on bike rides and walking (laughs) up the hills and stuff like that. You really can't neglect your own health, even in the midst of it. Otherwise, you may find that you need a caregiver one day, right? So how are you now, Ellen? How did you get through burning out and all of that stuff and and uh, yeah and help others? Well, it really definitely yeah. It took some time. It really did take some time. Um, I am really in a very good place right now. Uh, My children are in a really very good place now, um, which is of course very important to me. Uh, but it did take some time. I had to feel that grief. Uh, I was really quite angry mm-hmm. for some time. You know, um, friends of mine just really couldn't put up with my anger. And I, you know, actually they're back in my life now. 
but they just like like ooh ooh it's the, like stay away from her i was so angry um, but actually it was my parish priest who met with me once a week and he really allowed my anger i mean mm. he, he kids me now because i would get to the edge of my seat and he <laughs> once, and he does it now he he does it now and he'll point at me like this and apparently i was getting to the edge, edge of my seat and i was i was expressing anger it wasn't like at him or to him but it was no. because he he was the only one in the room so he right. was listening to me he was listening to me and um and he, and sometimes he would fight back he would he would maybe disagree with what i was saying and and that was helpful too it was a safe space to be angry and um actually i met with him once a week really for quite some time and now we just have a really good friendship because of that mm -hmm. Yeah, and and as I say, my my friends and my siblings who stayed away from me, I just spent the weekend with them. So um, it really takes time, you know. But not to not to uh, avoid it or not to squash it, you know, not to stuff it down. It's it's like feel it, express it, talk about it with someone uh, trustworthy. I found someone so trustworthy, and. Um, and just it just it was it was years before i was well again i i hate to admit that but it's true yeah now you bring up a great point i have this care formula c-a-r-e care communicate with your friends don't isolate yourself from them you know don't rag on them mm -hmm. don't tell them what a rotten day you had save that for your stroke well in my case stroke support group but every uh, mm -hmm. ailment has a support group uh, even cancer etc were you a part of a support group? Because otherwise they're not gonna come around. You're gonna isolate them and nobody wants to be around a Debbie Downer. Yeah. You know, uh, my husband passed away in 2003. So, um, and as I say, hospice came on board less than 24 hours um, uh, within his death. I, I don't know why I didn't get the hospice services after death. I. I really have, maybe my brother answered the phone and told him I didn't need them. Because my brother stayed with me for quite some time afterwards. So, because now I know very well that part of hospice care is 13 months of support mm -hmm. and various support. The bereavement group, 13 months they, they are reaching out to you for support. And sadly, right. no, I, I didn't have that type of support, I, but I did have it in my pastor. Adrian, did you get support afterwards? Well, this I had the support from the same group that I was in. But uh, not which from is, hospice. But not, no, I never had hospice for Steve. He, yeah, he, even, even my relatives, my uncle, my mother, um, they really didn't come by after the death. He might have called and says, are you doing okay? And if we said yes, maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. I don't remember. Well, my parents were both gone. And uh, I had I had a few friends who really distanced themselves. And I could have, I could have used, I suppose, hospice. There, there's a, there are a few grief groups in New York you know, uh, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that I was going to go to. And then because I started to create the caregiver space and I, part of the reason that I was creating it was because I knew that people who survived caregiving needed the support because of that hole that's in your life. You've given so much to the person that was sick and now they're not there. They're not. They're not there yeah, anymore. You just mm -hmm. have this huge hole. So yeah, I wanted that, to make remember sure that, that big that void. I wanted. I wanted to be there for that group too, very much so, because people were there for me ahead of time. You know, before. Everyone was going through it. And the sad thing was, it was the Cancer Support Network through the American Cancer Society. And they made you leave 
your regular group to go into an aftercare group so that all of the people that you had gotten to know and had supported you were no longer in your life and you had to you know, find a whole new circle of people for support. And I didn't like that. So I said, uh-uh, I ain't going to do it that way. <laughs> and I didn't. Well, yeah, you know, um, uh, you're working in hospice now. Is, is it difficult for you to go through all this stuff and watch people go through it, uh, of what you went through with your husband? Or is it therapeutic for you? Mm -hmm. Well, when I was the hospice volunteer, it was therapeutic for me. When I became uh, the RN on the hospice team, it, it, it's, it continues to be cathartic, but um, I have to say in 13 years, I, twice, it was incredibly painful because it just just was so close to home. It just reminded me so much mm. of my personal uh, journey with my husband. But that was twice in 13 years. All those years, um, it, yeah. Yeah, it, it's not difficult because really, I I don't love my patients. I care for them very, very much. I loved my husband. I still love my husband. So yeah. I want to care for those who love each other. So mm -hmm. I am, I, my parents are gone. My, my six year old niece died, my sister, three brother-in-laws, my brother. So I just feel like I, I could, I could, I just witness their love and how much they want to help each other. So I'm there to help them help yeah. each other. Yeah. Wow. Well, what else would you like to talk about that we haven't discussed yet? I've gone down my list of mm. questions. Is there things that uh, that you feel led to discuss? You know, I we, I really uh, do want to. Mm -hmm. I do, I do, and 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 it's really the use of morphine because in my 13 years of working in hospice, it. it and, you know, it continues to surprise me, but I don't know why. Uh, you know, I know why, because I, because morphine is an age-old drug. It's an incredibly helpful drug, and it is used at end of life. For quality of life, prior to the active dying phase, but most often during the active dying phase, because at that phase, there's breathing pattern changes, yeah. right? And then, and Very the morphine, much. right? And the morphine just, it, it smooths out the chest muscles that are kicking in, that naturally kick in, and the abdominal muscles that naturally kick in for our physical body that is, is, is slowing down. down. Yeah, and shutting down. And so naturally our body works harder at this stage it's just it's a natural event so morphine given in small dosages just helps the individual not work so hard at breathing for these breathing pattern changes and so often people think it's the morphine killing the individual mm -hmm. our patients are dying morphine is given to help to assist, to make it more comfortable. And, and at home, we're teaching the people at home to administer this morphine. They, mm -hmm. are not, they are not killing their loved one administering the morphine. Their loved one is dying, and the morphine is there to, to help a comfortable death. Not quicken death, not hasten death, but allow a comfortable death. I think yeah. there are a lot. I think there are a lot of people who, who believe that in hospice that morphine is used uh, to hasten death. I believe that's that the, a lot of the people myth. believe that, 
And yes, yes. that's the myth. But do you believe that some people are misusing it and doing it that way? Not in my experience. Mm -mm. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, my brother-in-law mm -hmm. was a healthy guy. He was like 84. He was working, you know, he's in the asphalt business. And, and then one day his back started hurting just instantly like that. Uh, he just gave me a bid on my gas station to do the uh, asphalt. Like three days later, he was in the hospital. Uh, with back pain and they found some tumors and next thing you know man he had tubes coming in and out of him and and he said uh, mm. Marie take me home I'm not dying like this found cancer you know and so mm -hmm. uh, they took him home with uh, oxygen and morphine and this and that and he said his goodbyes to everybody uh, three or four days at home and was comfortable and he would have his you know high periods and his sleepy periods and and it, it was it just went perfectly the way it was supposed to go my sister didn't Lovely. have to have this long drawn out caregiving thing and that's the way i want to go <laughs> if you <laughs> if my kids are listening <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. i kid around i says you know if i ever get demented like that i'll show you where the guns are make it look like an accident you know <laughs> i gotta quit saying that because uh <laughs> that's evidence <laughs> well actually i i had to stop telling my children um certain things you know i i think i and i was saying it too long too often so I did my healthcare proxy and my living will and my wishes uh, about uh, artificial nutrition and IV fluids mm -hmm. and all of that is all written down and I do not mention it at all. They know where the forms are in the lockbox, they know. Mm -hmm. And you bring up another good point of helping people to fill out their advanced directives. What do you recommend? I know some of it is personal preference but what what are like the the obvious ones that they should and should not have in their advanced directive mm -hmm. using yours um, as a model because you seem like a sensible person right okay <laughs> right so it's it's really about do you want iv fluids or not i chose not to uh, it's, and why it's very... let's talk about this slowly why okay. did you choose not to Okay, a, a, a person who is dying, every organ, every organ, our skin is the organ. That's why there's bed sores. It's the largest organ of our body. Our brains, I mean, every, every organ, our heart, our lungs, our kidneys, our stomach, our pancreas, all our organs are slowing down. Our intestines, our small intestines, our large intestines, every organ is slowing down allowing a now if you add iv fluids into this blowing down process that's that's an insult to a a very natural process so very often the iv fluids will go into the proper channels which is the blood system but at a certain point those IV fluids will third space. And what third spacing is, will go inside the tissues, in between our organs, rest in our lungs. Does that sound comfortable? No. <laughs> that is not comfortable. Right. So we think, the people loving this individual think, we gotta do whatever we can. You know, if they stop eating IV fluids, we have to do whatever we can. And, and whatever you can is, don't do that. It's, yeah. That okay, could cause more harm than good. Okay, uh, artificial nutrition. So a lot of people um, decide on artificial nutrition because nursing homes have uh, criteria in order to stay, you need artificial nutrition. So again, it's, you know, it's really tugging at your heartstrings uh, about this artificial nutrition. I have decided no artificial nutrition. And that doesn't mean you're going to feel hunger like you're starving to death, right? Oh, okay. Thank you. 
Dave, that's wonderful. That is so good that you just brought that up because what happens, again, death is so natural. It is as natural as childbirth. So as our body is slowing down and breaking down and, and journeying to death, it's very natural for this to occur. Our brain lets off chemicals, which act like endorphins. We are not starving our loved one to death. They are not thirsty. It's, it's a very natural progression and our body knows how to take care of it. So these chemicals okay. are released and uh, this dehydration is not used. That term is not used. Nice to know. So uh, no um, nutrition, no liquids, what else? Um, In your advanced direction. Well, of directive. course, no respirator. No respirator, no, no cardiopulmonary us, resuscitation. Uh, it helps us breathe, right? Yeah. Right, the, so, so, so it, so is it uncomfortable if, stops, if we're having trouble breathing and the respirator will comfort us, but you're saying no respirator. So what happens when we do no respirator? We feel like we're suffocating. Well, not hospice patients. Patients on hospice care aren't suffocating because they are being visited a uh, couple of times a week. Of our, our hospice service is a couple of times a week. And so we are recognizing every physical symptom as it occurs, keeping the individual comfortable as it occurs. So, so there's no, no ugly death like that happening. No, no uncomfortable and then, and then death how about like that happening. The paddles or CPR, you say no to those. I'm right. Assuming. Well, well, definitely. And, and that's something that if you go into, if you, it may happen on the street that they use paddles or you go to the ER and, and that's something that, that you're resuscitated with, but yeah, it, that is, I mean, these I'm, are all such this personal covers choices. So many I'm not using them. I'm not using them. Yeah, yeah but what I'm if not, you're I don't in want an automobile, cardiopulmonary what if resuscitation or paddle. What if you're in an automobile mm -hmm. accident, you're not in a hospice or palliative care situation, you're not dying right. and they're trying to stop the bleeding, et, et cetera, or let's say they lose you, the heart right. stops but, beating. Uh, maybe you do want them mm. to give you the paddles, you know, maybe you do want. Yeah, to right. If you're, if you're a healthy, if you're a healthy individual, better. So a respirator may be for the short term right. for a healthy body so and healthy then, and, short -term and then you come the off the rest. Right. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. And then well, you, great. Yeah. Well, I think we've run out of time. Uh, how do we get a hold of you? How do we buy your book? Um, okay, Love, Death, Love by Ellen Long Stowell. You could get it online, uh, balboapress.com, or you can get it through Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Great, and I'm at Caregiver Dave, caregiverdave.com. Adrian is at thecaregiverspace.org. And that's a wrap for today. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and everybody, we'll see you next time. Same place, same channel. So, bye-bye. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing.